This will be a simple talk, I hope. I'm going to start and finish with just one question. If you forget everything in between, that's fine. But as people who make things, I want to help us ask one simple question. What could go wrong? That's it. Every line of code, test, every user story, gem, deploy, every time you SSH into production without telling anyone. <laughs> what could go wrong? Now, obviously, there's a way to ask this rhetorically, right? We know what this looks like, uh, whether we're about to set our friend on fire <laughs> or uh, whether you need to cross a bridge with just a little bit more river under it than usual. <laughs> and I think there's a conversation happening here that seems familiar to me, and I think it's familiar to a lot of us. We can make it. No, we can't. And I think the same conversation uh, happens in both professional and personal contexts, whether you're parenting or pushing to production. So my goal today is to help us ask that question a little more critically. What could go wrong? Not only so that we can make better decisions, but also so that we can disagree uh, more robustly about crossing the bridge. A long time ago in another life, I studied environmental chemistry. And I don't remember too much about my chemistry degree, but I remember a couple of things. One, everything is toxic if you've got enough of it in the right attitude. <laughs> and two, Danger has two factors, risk and hazard. Now, chemistry was a long time ago, and as soon as I say that, I'm terrified someone's going to come up to me afterwards and say, well, actually, ISO 31000 defines, and you know what, you're probably right. So let's be really clear and simple. Uh, the OED describes danger as the possibility of suffering harm and injury. Again, two factors, possibility, harm, just like risk Hazard, two factors, the terminology doesn't matter so much. But just to appease the ISO gods, uh, let's say instead that the dangerousness of something is determined by its likeliness and its badness. <laughs> Ultimately, I want us, every time we ask what could go wrong, to ask how likely is it and how bad is it. This is it. This is the talk. What could go wrong? How likely is it? How bad is it? So let's break this down a little bit. If I tried to walk across a gymnast's beam, about a meter or so off the ground, I'm very confident I could do that. I'd be fine. But if we put that beam at the height of the top of the forum, it's about 50 meters, I understand. No amount of money, and I thought about this for a bit, no <laughs> amount of money is going to convince me to do that. And I think, I hope that's intuitive for most of us. But let's think about what's actually changing here. The likeliness of falling is about the same. I'm just as capable. In fact, if anything, I am far more motivated to step accurately <laughs> across the beam. But the badness changes dramatically. If I fell from that height, I'd hit the ground at about 112 kilometers an hour. So the scenario is more dangerous, not because I'm more likely to fall, but because the badness changed from, oh, that looked dumb, to I'm almost certainly dead. Let's return to our disagreement on the bridge. What are we actually disagreeing about here? Sure, everyone agrees if the bridge collapses, that would be very bad. But maybe uh, someone thinks it's definitely going to go and someone else thinks, no, it'll be fine. And we get to the heart of the disagreement. It's about likeliness. And maybe everyone can see 100% definitely a wave is going to hit the car. But maybe someone thinks, ah, oh, that won't be too bad. And someone else thinks, it's going to break the car. Now, I don't know how cars or rivers or bridges work, but as we actually start to identify the, the things that could go wrong and we distinguish the badness and the likeliness, we can start to disagree more rigorously about the danger. Everyone agrees it would be very bad if we died. We just disagree how likely that is. Which brings us to, uh, who's heard of a micromort? A micromort is a qu defined quantum of dangerousness. It's a one in a million chance in death. So the, the likelihood is one in a million, and the badness is a single death. <laughs> so you get micromort data for travel, suggesting here that per kilometer, flying is far safer than any other form of transport. It'd be interesting to see that same data per trip, though. And this is all sourced from Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt. 
Uh, similarly, for recreational risks, scuba diving, marathon, and skydiving are all about the same, which surprises me. I've run a couple of marathons and skydived, and that did not seem equally dangerous. <laughs> Then we've got crazy dangerous sports base jumping is notoriously risky, of course, and uh, Everest has had 223 fatalities from 5,500 ascents, so there's your micro remote danger. To put these risks in perspective, though, in Australia in 2016, the risk of childbirth to a mother was an order of magnitude riskier than skydiving, and that's about normal. In fact, that's quite good by world standards. But it surprised me in terms of the relative risks. Because it didn't really match the stories we tell ourselves about these things. And it pays to remember, these are population level statistics, right? The more I dug into the, the details and the data of that risk, the more shocked, and really shocked, I was about how wrong my stories and assumptions were. And it's at this point that I start to realize how often my perception of danger isn't driven by knowledge, but it's driven by my, my discourses and my social narratives. Because underneath all of this logic, we have to remember we have the brains of social primates. Uh, two and a half thousand years ago, Aristotle wrote that a human is by nature a social animal. And modern neuroscientists like Matthew Lieberman seem to agree. He argues that the human brain has been primed by evolution to view the world in predominantly social terms. So our, our neural biology is overwhelmingly wired for uh, social cognition, and much less for the kind of statistical cognition we need for risk analysis. One of the most common ways I see this play out is the tendency to fixate on a single factor when we're thinking about danger. So for example, uh, we can easily fixate on the low likelihood of something and completely discount the, the high hazard of a scenario. We might call this complacency. So we have an eight-seater car, uh, and even with the reversing camera, I am ashamed to admit I have backed into more than one pole. <laughs> so now we have this little jingle. Uh, when we're reversing, the kids recite this little safety jingle because it's just so easy to think, ah, it'll never happen to me, and forget how unimaginably bad it would be if something did happen. Alternatively, we can fixate on the high badness of something and completely ignore the very low risk factor, and we might call this hysteria. So uh, Gerd Geigerenzer is a psychologist who studies decision making, and he talks about how in the 12 months after 9-11, an estimated 16,000 Americans died on the road because of choosing to, to drive long distance rather than fly. And he suggests that the, the very real threat of that road toll is not as compelling or scary to us because the real hazard that we perceive isn't just a death, but it's the, the thought of uh, many people dying together at once. And maybe there's some evolutionary psychology behind that, but we can see from our collective behavior, even if that doesn't resonate as individuals, we can see collectively that that fear and that single factor fixation, it's simply part of our social inheritance, whatever the reason. There's also a special type of likeliness fixation, and that's where we fixate on a completely misguided sense of the probability. Uh, I was reading recently about a six-year-old who got lost in the woods near his home, and rather than wait to be rescued, he hiked for two days and rescued himself. A six-year-old who hiked for... I have a six-year-old. <laughs> and I think how you interpret that story depends entirely on who you follow on Twitter. But the thing to remember is that I read that story because he survived, right? This survivorship bias. The fact that something went right doesn't really tell us how likely it was to go wrong. The truth is, though, that is just how our brains work, whether it's survivorship bias or complacency or hysteria or whatever. 
This is how our brains work. And so many of our instincts are governed by social factors. Your family of origin, your tribal ideology, um, the beliefs we've built around our identity and our, our sense of belonging. And the, the rational layers of our brains are really only a recent add-on. But while we certainly we do have some hurdles to overcome when thinking about danger, I believe if we can be mindful about our, our biases, and if we can think about danger in a structured way, we're actually pretty good at this. Uh, we might be social primates, but we went to the moon. When we code, the answer to the question, what could go wrong, depends on, on all of the broad context uh, around the specific particular thing that we're trying to do. So it's a little bit artificial to try and demonstrate this at a conference talk. That said, let's start at the line of code level. Here's a simple working method. We're fetching a, a file from a URL. If you can't read all of the code, don't worry, that's not so important. You'll get the gist. What could go wrong? Let's start with nil. What happens if URL is nil? Uh, how likely is that? I'm a Rubyist. It is extremely likely. <laughs> how bad is it? Well, we test it out. We, we see we get an argument error from the first method there. It's pretty clear what's gone wrong. That's not that bad. So it's likely it's not that bad in this context. I'm going to say it's not dangerous enough to fix. What else? What about a blank string or just a garbage string? Turns out those are all valid URIs. So instead, we get a very obscure error from NetHttp. It's hard to see what's gone wrong. I figure it's just as likely as getting a nil. So this is worth fixing. We'll catch that scenario, raise a clear error. Now we've got a valid HTTP URL. What could go wrong next? There's this whole class of connectivity errors, DNS, uh, connection timeouts, host errors. How likely is it? It's the internet. It's highly likely. How bad is it? Again, we test it. We see the, ex uh, the exceptions are pretty good. They're descriptive. We know what's gone wrong. Maybe we could catch them all and re-raise them. Um, but I don't think that's dangerous enough to fix. OK, we've now got a response from the server. What's wrong next? Uh, what if we get a 404 or a 500? How likely is that? Again, we're on the internet. Uh, how bad is that? I think this is actually worse than failure, because it doesn't fail. You think you've succeeded. You have no indication that anything's gone wrong. So this is likely, it's bad, we definitely need to fix that. It turns out Ruby gives us a value method on net uh, HTTP response, which raises on any non-200 status code. Who knew? That definitely gets a comment. What else could go wrong with the response? What about if we have a 300, a redirection? How bad is it right now? We get an exception. How likely is it? Well, I only thought about that because it happened while I was testing. <laughs> So that's likely enough for me. We will uh, we'll catch that, we'll test the response, we will recurse with our new location. What's next? I think it is very unlikely that we will get stuck in a redirect loop. But how bad would it be if we did? This is not some misleading success. It's not a, a hard to decipher exception. It just keeps going. And if you're connecting to a slow server, it keeps going again and again and again, again until it eventually runs out of stack. This is the worst scenario, I think, that we've seen so far. Even though it's very unlikely, we definitely want to fix it. So it's getting a little bit more complicated now. We'll throw in our max redirects. We'll raise if that gets exceeded. But we've got a robust way to fetch a response. Now, we could keep going. We could keep thinking about fetching multi-gigabyte uh, files on a 512 meg Heroku Dino, et cetera. But I think that's enough for now. Compare this to our original implementation. The happy path is roughly the same. But now we've asked, what could go wrong? And, and note that this is not purely defensive 
coding, right? There were some scenarios that we thought about and we thought, this is not bad enough, this is not dangerous enough to warrant handling. But the real dangers have been mitigated. So that's one application uh, of that mindset at the line of code level. Here's a bit of a counterexample. Many years ago, I needed a unique, non-guessable key for a record. That's a pretty common and straightforward scenario. Back then, and I know there are better ways to do this now, uh, but back then, I just added a callback to generate a UUID. Worked perfectly. What could go wrong? Now, I had written previous to this, I had written a blog post on this exact subject, specifically noting that you would need 112 terabytes of UUIDs before you even have a one in a billion chance of a collision. In part of my brain, I know the likeliness. And a collision isn't even that bad. We've got a unique constraint on the column. It's an exception. No one's getting hurt. But somehow, a year later, There's no way I should have bothered. But the part of my brain that lets me sleep at night is not the same part of my brain <laughs> that analyzes and quantifies danger. And that's just the way that is. Let's step up a level from the code. Uh, recently, we've been streaming Salesforce data. Uh, and that's a pretty complex protocol. The code is fragile, and it's mission critical. So it is very likely to break badly. Now, the temptation is to ask the question, what could go wrong? We've answered it, and then we say, right, we need tests. But we can't stop asking the question yet. What could go wrong with conventional tests? They'd be very brittle. would be a lot of mocking. would need uh, very likely to change. They'd be very hard to read. So if automated tests are also dangerous, what else? We actually dropped the automated testing in that part of the app, and we wrote an interactive test script. Now, that's a pretty unconventional trade-off. That's not very idiomatic. But it reduces the danger without introducing a whole lot of new ones like automated testing would. And I think it's easy to get stuck in uh, patterns like 100% uh, automated test coverage. But if you keep asking that question, then you can move beyond best practice and actually mitigate the specific dangers that you're dealing with and, and not just dangers in general. So you can kind of innovate around dangers if you keep asking the question. One last example before I wrap. I've been working on some authentication recently. And I noticed that even though the response is the same, no matter whether you get your password or your email wrong, the response time was measurably different. Not noticeably different, but measurably different. So technically, you could perform user enumeration. Uh, of course, that's because uh, bcrypt is very intentionally slow. So if you don't have a user's password hash to check it against, it's going to be quicker. So I spent considerable effort writing constant time password authentication. What could go wrong? Well, now the code is a lot less intuitive. Uh, small changes affect the timing. So it's very likely that someone breaks it badly. So I spent considerable effort writing a spec to compare the timing. What could go wrong? Well, now we have a non-deterministic test. The timing changes every uh, run. Depending on the sensitivity, it's either uh, more likely to give a false positive or more likely to give a false negative. How bad is that? Well, we've got flapping tests, unreliable CI, angry developers. We've all been there. So I spent considerable effort avoiding timing jitters and taking medians and interleaving iterations and making sure we had a statistically significant sample size, even wrangling garbage collection all to write a reliable timing comparison spec helper. What could go wrong with that? The thing is, user enumeration via a timing attack, it's not ideal, 
But in our context, it's not that bad. It's low risk, low impact, low badness, low likeliness, low danger. You know the real reason I wrote these hundreds of lines of quite complex code? Ego. <laughs> because I wanted to prove I could. And because my, my uh, patterns of social cognition overpowered my rational cognition. And you never notice it at the time, right? It's only when you're writing a conference talk months later. <laughs> So the subtle science of coding for failure. Next time you're writing code or designing a system or reversing down the driveway, I want you to ask three questions. What could go wrong? How likely is it? And how bad is it? So when we're sitting in the car at the bridge together, figuratively, I hope, let's answer those questions as rationally as possible. But also remember, we are not perfectly rational people. So let's also use these big social brains to at least be kind to each other. OK, let's see. You can all breathe again. <laughs> if you're interested in this stuff, I've got lots of sources, lots more data. I'd love to talk with you. Come and find me afterwards or online. Thank you very much.